to the attic. What a third day we are having on this uh, Big Think conference. Very interesting and intense. We already had two of our keynotes. We're coming, to, we're coming, we're going to jump onto our third. I hope you're ready because this promise, promises to be very interesting as well. Yesterday, if you were at the attic with us, uh, you might remember with uh, Vyacheslav Kobayevsky, also known as Love, and Gonzalo Gasca, how it was possible to turn the popular Jupyter notebooks into production grade code. Now we turn to Elira, a set of open source AI centric extensions to Jupyter Lab. Our next speaker believes that Elira has a great capability that he wants to share with us as another way to take notebooks right down the pipeline. Let's welcome Nick Pentreth. He's the, pi the principal at engineer at IBM. Nick, welcome. Hello, yes. Uh, thanks How very are you, much Nick? Uh, for having me. And I'm well and you. It's a pleasure to have you, to have IBM uh, on this uh, Big Things Conference 2020. Um, you know that uh, we have the chance to uh, offer the audience to ask you questions through the platform. So uh, remember that the last five minutes we'll hope to receive the questions through, um, through my iPad and they're sending them through the chat. So remind, I remind the audience to write you or send the questions for you to answer uh, within the next uh, 35 minutes. Nick, is that okay with you? Perfect, sounds great. Excellent. So whenever you're ready, we're looking forward to listening to you. Okay, thanks very much. Um, so welcome to this uh, Big Things talk on notebook-based AI pipelines with Elira and Kubeflow. Uh, certainly a very different experience from the previous um, Big Data Spain conferences that I've been to. Um, but certainly I uh, hope that you all had a great, great time and thank you for joining me today. Um, I'm Nick Pentry. I'm a principal engineer at IBM, where I work for a team called the Center for Open Source Data and AI Technologies, or CODE. I focus on machine learning and AI applications within the open source uh, ecosystem. I've been involved with the Apache Spark project for a long time, where I'm a committer and PMC member, um, and I'm author of the book Machine Learning with Spark. And I present at various conferences, meetups, uh, webinars, and more recently, a lot of online events around the world about the intersection of uh, machine learning, data science, AI, and open source. Before we start, a little bit about CODE, the Center for Open Source Data and AI Technologies. We're a team within IBM of over 30 open source developers, advocates, designers, and our focus is on improving the enterprise AI lifecycle in the open source uh, ecosystem. We work on foundational technologies for IBM's data and AI offerings. Uh, and this includes the Python data science stack. Uh, Apache Spark is obviously a large part of that. Uh, deep learning frameworks like TensorFlow, PyTorch, uh, AI fairness and ethics uh, frameworks that have been released by our team uh, coming from IBM Research, orchestration platforms and workflow engines like Kubeflow, model deployment uh, standards and frameworks, including KF Serving, which I'll mention today, open projects for uh, sharing uh, open data sets and open source uh, deep learning models, the data asset exchange and model asset exchange. And of course, the Python data science stack, including Jupyter, scikit-learn, pandas, and others, uh, is a core component of that. And that's what we'll be really be focusing on today is the intersection of Jupyter and Elira. So we'll start with an overview of the machine learning workflow, talk about uh, Jupyter Notebooks, Jupyter Lab, uh, and Elira, and give an introduction to Elira. Uh, then hopefully the most interesting part, um, a live demo, and we'll wrap up. So starting with the machine le learning workflow, uh, this typically starts with data. And we, we have a lot of data you know, lying around in various places, most of it in fairly raw and somewhat messy format, um, and it's not particularly useful in that format. So the first step is to analyze that data. Typically, we need to uh, process it uh, into a form that's amenable for machine learning models. It does not arrive uh, in a nice format uh, in, of vectors or tensors that we can just simply feed into an algorithm. We have to apply a lot of feature extraction, pre-processing, uh, and various other transformation steps before we can actually train a model. We then have the training phase, which itself is a, a typical uh, sub-workflow where we are uh, trying out different models, uh, different pipelines, training different models to find the, the one that performs the best for our particular problem and our particular data set. Um, and then it's not much good to have a machine learning model uh, without it actually being used for something out in the real world. So we then need to deploy that model. 
Um, and this workflow actually in reality is a loop because typically once that model is out there, we are predicting on new data, we still need to maintain it. Um, and a new data is coming in um, or the model is creating a new training data of its, of its own if it's interacting, for example, with users or the, or the world around it. Uh, and that really feed, takes us back to the beginning of this process. So it closes the loop. Now this workflow spans teams. And the first of those is typically our data engineers who are working uh, with uh, the data storage, uh, providing access to other teams. Um, so access control, data provenance and governance, uh, and uh, making sure that, that uh, all the other teams and parts of this pipeline can actually access the data that they need. Then the data scientists and research teams are going to be uh, typically working on the middle part of this flow, which is taking in the data from all these sources, uh, running their an analytics, uh, their, their pre-processing and their machine learning pipelines. And then the deployment and maintenance phase is typically the problems of your machine learning and your production engineers. It also spans many different tools. Uh, so various data formats, ways of storing data, in the data silos uh, for the for each phase of the data science workflow uh, you have a plethora of different uh, tools frameworks um, and, and approaches and then when deploying there are a number of different um, mechanisms formats for exporting and many many different ways of deploying these models so any uh, medium to large size organization is going to have to deal with all of these a core part of this workflow, and in particular, this middle bit, which is uh, a data science and machine learning research type of workflow, is that of iteration and experimentation. You typically don't have a team uh, or data scientist who can just uh, take the data and immediately uh, throw it into you know, a, a pipeline and get a model out. Most of the time, you have to start analyzing uh, what what is the makeup of the data? What kind of variables, features? What are the characteristics and distribution of the data? What are the different data sources that we can potentially combine? Um, so the data scientist goes through this uh, sub workflow of loading, uh, cleaning data, exploring it, and then interpreting that data. Now, that itself is typically not a one off workflow. Uh, most of the time, data science does not happen uh, just in isolation, it's part of a, a business need and it's looking to fulfill. Uh, a business uh, a business goal. So most of the time that's going to be trying to answer questions uh, of the business or, or solve a particular business problem. Uh, in many cases, these, these questions are somewhat ill-defined and as answers to the questions arise, uh, so more questions are, are actually asked. So the answers lead to, much, to more exploration. So we have this refining step where that analysis and the pipeline, the whole pipeline uh, is, is carried out again uh, you know, incorporating new data, incorporating different ways of analyzing it, um, updating it, and so on. So there's a lot of uh, iterative process that happens here. Um, and the same is true during the machine learning uh, workflow phase. So here we have another sub-workflow, which is uh, typically taking the raw data, extracting features, doing pre-processing and transformation, training a model, and then if evaluating it on you know, some sort of evaluation or, or test a data set to try and get a sense of how that model might perform on, in the real world when deployed. But again, this is uh, not a one-off process. Uh, there's a lot of iteration and experimentation that happens here. So the machine learning uh, researchers and data scientists are going to try out different pipelines, different models, different ways of extracting features, uh, pre-processing them different parameters, different combinations of all of these, um, these components in the pipeline. Uh, and uh, over time, we're going to refine uh, these different components and, and refine the process to get better and better models. And of course, as new data comes in, um, as, as the, the business landscape or the, the problem domain changes, as the underlying data distri distribution changes over time, the customer behavior and so on, uh, there's a constant um, refining um, and iteration of this process. So that needs to be supported um, in these workflows. And we've seen notebooks, in particular Jupyter notebooks, um, the standard for this kind of interactive and iterative workflows um, that, is, that is also very content rich. So notebooks have emerged you know, to, to allow uh, 
experimentation, of data visualization, a lot of interactivity um, and kind of web-based uh, functionality that is available in the notebooks. So this uh, is great and it solves many of the, the requirements and problems for an iterative workflow, but it does have some, some drawbacks, uh, in particular when trying to move things to production. So notebooks uh, and, and the process by which uh, notebooks are iterated on uh, typically result in, you know, in a large monolithic uh, piece of code. So one notebook which starts small as an explore, exploratory uh, notebook may end up having you know, hundreds and hundreds of cells and doing everything um, effectively this entire pipeline in one place. So it becomes very difficult to uh, to actually work with that um, uh, to modularize those notebooks. Um, and you can't just kind of throw that, that monolith over the wall to production. Uh, scaling notebooks, you know, typically will be running on a, on a local machine. Um, not always easy to, to scale out uh, notebook-based pipelines and make use of cluster resources, uh, GPUs, and so on. So this is really what Elira um, is trying to, to solve. Elira is a set of AI-centric extensions to Jupyter Lab notebooks. Um, Elira is uh, one of the moons of Jupyter, and uh, hence the name Elira comes from, from, from a, that adaptation of that. And you can see here Elira is a, is a, a moon uh, orbiting in the, the Jupyter ecosystem. So some of the key features of Elira, um, first, the, the visual pipeline editor. So this is a, uh, a Canvas workspace for creating pipelines that are composed of multiple notebooks and Python scripts. Um, it's effectively a, a DAG, a directed acyclical graph that can be built, uh, built up to represent workflows. And we can see here an example uh, where, where we're loading data, doing some data cleansing, and then branching out into multiple types of, of uh, downstream tasks, including uh, potentially machine learning and analytics. So this allows us to compose uh, these Python scripts and, and, and notebooks into a workflow that can actually then be executed um, on various uh, targets. So Lyra allows you to run these locally, uh, just in the local environment, but you can also run remotely on Kubeflow pipelines. At the moment, uh, that is the, the main uh, backing target. There may be more in the future. But this allows you to, to essentially scale up um, uh, your resources. Similarly, uh, you can submit an individual notebook or script as a, a batch job uh, running on Kubeflow pipelines. And this is effectively uh, a, a, sing a single node, single stage pipeline. But it, al it allows uh, effectively you know, a push to cloud resources uh, from your local machine. You can uh, edit and execute Python scripts against uh, resource, these local or cloud-based resources. And there's a few other uh, features like uh, automatically generating table of contents, uh, which is a Jupyter Lab extension, uh, a library of code snippets that, that allow you to, um, to edit and, and maintain uh, code snippets that, uh, uh, that can be dropped into your notebooks, um, and Git integration, which allows you to, uh, to check out projects directly from Git uh, within Jupyter Lab um, and you know, do updates and, and push changes and collaborate with the team. So we've seen how this workflow uh, is it's made up of these different uh, phases. And the, the goal here is, is to really create more modular pipelines with notebooks and scripts by Lyra. So instead of having this, this huge model of uh, which, which becomes unwieldy, we split up the, um, the work into these, these kind of logical units and we, we stitch them together using the Alira pipelines. So just briefly about uh, Kubeflow, um, the, the, the idea behind using uh, one of these you know, workflow orchestration engines is to be able to scale up uh, this modular pipeline that we saw before um, and allow us to run you know, uh, effectively unlimited size jobs. And Kubeflow is, is a, a very popular and you know, emergingly common way of doing this. And it's a machine learning platform that runs in Kubernetes. So this means that um, it's standardized and, and can be uh, deployed on premise you know, within a hybrid cloud or, or various public clouds. It provides support for running Jupyter notebooks as, uh, as nodes, um, as well as various other, other components. Um, and Kubeflow Pipelines uh, is a platform built on top of Kubeflow that allows you to, uh, to deploy these machine learning workflows and scale them up. So 
you define a, a set of pipeline artifacts which is compiled into a workflow specification, uh, this, this, this directed acyclical graph effectively. You can upload that pipeline and then run it uh, on, on, on Cube. Uh, on Kubeflow Kubernetes. Um, so that this allows you to, you know, to scale things up across a cluster. It allows parallel execution of, um, of nodes that can be executed in parallel. So the graph structures uh, allows the, all of these things to happen. So the idea we get with Elira is that uh, once we use the special pipeline editor to create um, our, our pipeline, Elira takes care of packaging that all up um, and creating the artifacts and a pipeline definition that will then be executed on Kubeflow. You can also obviously run them locally, uh, and we'll see some examples of that. So I'm now going to uh, switch over to uh, the demo. Okay. So we've seen uh, you know, a bit of the presentation around what Elira is all about, um, but really, hopefully, the, the most interesting way of seeing what this, how this works are uh, seeing it in practice. So Elira runs within Jupyter Lab, and you can see we, this is the, the standard uh, Jupyter Lab launcher. Um, and here we've got a set of Elira specific components, the main one uh, being the pipeline editor, but you can also edit uh, Python files. Um, and we've got a link to uh, the documentation. So this is a, a demo project, um, which is available on GitHub uh, at uh, github.com forward slash coday uh, forward slash flight delay notebooks. So you can go and check it out, and the link will also be available in the slides. Um, but here I've, I've got uh, the, the project, and we can go and have a look at the pipelines that are here. This is a view of the Visual Pipeline Editor. And as you can see here, we have a set of nodes, um, including uh, Python scripts and, uh, and notebooks. And they're connected together uh, to represent this workflow, which is, a, which is in the form of a, a DAG. You can also add comments to each node uh, to, to give more context. So for example, here, a common use case is to, to uh, modularize and abstract out um, you know, common patterns, such as loading data from, from uh, specific data sources. So here we've got uh, two load data nodes, which are actually using exactly the same script, um, but they're just going to have you know, different arguments. And one is going to um, load a set of data about flight delays, and the other is going to load weather data. So our goal here is to try to uh, analyze and predict flight delays and the potential causes of those flight delays or factors involved in whether a flight will be delayed. Um, and we also want to try and enrich that analysis and, and the, the model building process with some extra data in the form of weather. So we're going to be using uh, two data sets that are, are hosted on the Data Asset Exchange, which is a project that I mentioned earlier. Uh, it's an, an open repository for, uh, for freely available uh, and uh, open data sets, many of which come from IBM Research. And uh, you can find that at ibm.biz forward slash data dash exchange. Uh, these particular two are, are not IBM specific data sets. Um, they're, they're common uh, public data sets involving uh, US flight delays for US airlines. And uh, in particular, we're going to be looking at uh, JFK Airport. So we've got a data set for the weather uh, for JFK Airport. So each of these nodes um, has a set of properties. And here we can obviously see the file name. We have a runtime image. Uh, now this is applying for when we when we execute on uh, the Kubeflow platform. Uh, this one is, is going to be running on pandas. In fact, we can we've got one you know, common images, predefined images for most of the, the common frameworks. And you can also create your own images and, and use them. You can see that we can pass in some information uh, in the form of environment variables. So for example, here we have uh, the, the data set URL where the data is going to be downloaded from. And we define, uh, we can define output files. Now these output files are not really used in local execution, but when we're running on Kubeflow, uh, we need to define the outputs of a node. And that means that these outputs are going to be available to all downstream tasks. As you can see here, 
these two nodes are, are essentially exactly the same, uh, except the, for the data set URL. Once we've done uh, the, the data loading, we then move on to uh, processing each data set. Uh, and the output of each of those processing steps is going to be uh, it's going to be put into the, the merge node. And that's where we're going to combine these two data sets, joining them together uh, and extract the features that we, that we then want to use for our downstream tasks. And those tasks are number one, analyzing flight delays. Uh, so doing some exploratory analysis and visualization and predicting flight delays, so building machine learning models. Now, in order to uh, execute these, you can just simply click on uh, the little run button. And this gives us a, a run pipeline dialog. So we just need to uh, insert a pipeline name and we can then run in place locally, or we can set up a Kubeflow uh, installation. So this could be a local, in this case, I'm just running locally. Um, but this could also be a, a cloud-based on-premises uh, Kubeflow cluster. So for now, we can just uh, execute locally. And you can see here that uh, that the pipeline is, is being executed locally by, uh, by Jupyter Lab. So it's, it's running in, in the same process in the same environment as we're running our Jupyter Lab. As that's running, we can see that it's going to be creating the, the downloading data from uh, from a external location, performing processing, and and when running locally, that's all going to land up actually here in our in a directory on our local machine. Uh, but of course, when you're running on Kubeflow, um, Kubeflow will take care of that. So while it's running, you can uh, take a look at some of the, the notebooks. So these are, you know, these are going to be fairly typical um, steps in a pipeline. You know, so uh, involving reading the raw data, uh, performing some cleaning up operations, uh, some basic transformation, filtering, and then saving that process data for downstream tasks. Similarly, when we're merging, we now have access to that uh, that data which is uh, coming from a previous step in the pipeline, we loaded, load both of these data sets, uh, perform the merge by joining them together, and potentially uh, potentially do some further processing. Uh, in this case, we can, just, we can simply save it out. We then have an, an analyzing uh, data notebook, and again, following this similar pattern. So uh, reading in the data and starting to perform some, some basic analysis. And so uh, this particular data set is a, a small subset of the entire data set, which is many gigabytes, over 80 gigabytes, uncompressed. So we're working with a much smaller sample for demo purposes. And it's further restricted to just the JFK uh, airport departures. And we're looking at the departure delay and whether that can be predicted. So it, you know, in this case, the delay is uh, predicted is, is when a flight is more than 15 minutes late. And we can see that 80% you know, of flights are on time, 20% are delayed. And if we start digging into uh, typical analysis that we might want to do as a data science project, we can look at uh, delays over time to see if there's any trends, uh, and we can start analyzing uh, the, the relative departure delay by different factors in our data set. So we can look at uh, aspects of the flight itself, such as you know, the, uh, day of the week, and these are all the, the, the great tools within the Python ecosystem that are at our disposal. Um, and then we can also uh, you know, look at departure time brackets, um, airlines to see if there's any you know, any particular airlines that seem to be more delayed than others, destination airports, and so on and so on. So what we really want to do here is, is also incorporate multiple different data sets uh, into the analysis. So here we can start looking at the different weather features, for example, to see you know, does drizzle, snow, mist, um, or thunderstorms have an impact on delay? And it, you know, it becomes immediately obvious that certain weather features are potentially interesting. For example, thunderstorms and snow, some, sometimes mist may have an impact. And then the final step is going to be actually predicting these flight delays. So can we take this data and um, create a model uh, where we can actually predict the flight delays? So 
this this particular notebook shows uh, your typical uh, approach of you know creating your training and test data splits, encoding your categorical variables, numerical variables, training and evaluate models using standards, you know, scikit-learn cross validation, um, and again we can we can then visualize the results, uh, create our classification reports, and do our analysis of things like feature importances and so on. Okay, uh, so you can see here that uh, pipeline is still running locally, uh, almost finished. But we can actually, if we want to, kick off a pipeline that runs on Kubeflow, and that's as simple as uh, just selecting the Kubeflow pipeline here. Um, and we can see here that uh, Ilaria is taking care of processing all the dependencies, packaging them all up, and it's going to send them to, uh, to Kubeflow runtime. So we'll be able to have a look at that uh, running as it starts. But for now, we can go and have a look at a previous run. So this is the Kubeflow pipelines uh, Use it UI, and you can see here that um, our pipeline is very similar to the way that, because uh, we actually see that our local execution was was successful, and we've also got run details um, for the remote uh, execution. So you can see here that uh, our Kubeflow pipeline run is going to is going to be beginning, um, and it's it's in it's in progress at the moment. So. Here we can see that the uh, the completed run looks uh, very similar to this part of the Celira pipeline, of course. Uh, we can then go and have a look at the um, things like the logs. And of course, if anything goes wrong, this is where we would spend our time to try and figure out you know, what, what, are the, what are any issues that happened. What's interesting here is that, um, and, and this is a bit of a sneak preview of, of, of uh, you know, forthcoming features in Elira. So this isn't yet in, available in, in the main branch, but um, but should be should be there in, a, in the future release pretty soon. Um, and this is that uh, as we saw in our um, predicting flight delays notebook, we, we often have a set of um, of outputs. You know, for example, visualizations or scores. So we may have, uh, for example, uh, you know, our our metrics, our um, our confusion metrics. Uh, and, and the various uh, classification or, or model accuracy metrics that we want to analyze. Now, when we're running on Kubeflow pipelines, um, bear in mind that uh, here the notebooks get updated when we run locally in place. But when we're running on Kubeflow pipelines, they actually get stored to an object storage location. So here we can see an example of that. Um, here's a, a local object storage, but this could be S3 or Google Cloud uh, storage or, or um, IBM Cloud Object Storage, whatever you want to be using, uh, all the artifacts are going to be um, going to be sent here. So again, we can then have a look at, uh, for example, predicting flight delays um, output. We can download that, and then we can open it up, and we can see that it's, it's essentially giving us the same result as you saw in our local execution. So this is the output from our Kubeflow pipeline. Um, that executed. But this still means that we have to go and find the results in object storage. Um, and we may want to just have a quick look at um, at, at what happened uh, and try and get a sense of you know, the, the outputs, the metrics, and so on for this pipeline. So uh, Elaria will, will soon allow you to export um, metrics as well as visualizations to the Kubeflow pipelines uh, UI. And here we can see we've, we've got some metrics, F1 scores are Cs. Uh, we've got a confusion matrix which we can pop out and have a look, kind of analyze. Uh, so this allows us to, you know, to, within the Kubeflow pipeline UI, to have a quick look at and see whether things are, are as you expect without having to necessarily dig through our object storage and find the correct run uh, and, and get you know, download the data and so on. Okay, so uh, that's the that's the basic pipeline. Um, one more thing which uh, which is interesting to look at is there's another version of the pipeline that we've created, um, which is also encompassing deploying the model. 
So deploy, model deployment is, uh, is obviously a whole field in itself. But here we, we have a, a node that is going to actually allow you to deploy the model uh, to Q, QFO serving, KF serving. And here's an example of, uh, of a run which actually did that. Uh, so it's got the deploy model phase. And, uh, and if you have KF serving, uh, QFO serving running in your QFO cluster, um, it allows you to to deploy it to that service. You can also do this locally if you're running a, a local deployment. So this, this is going to take the output of, you know, of this, the trained model from the last, part of the, uh, last node of the pipeline, um, deploy it, and then here we see an example where we actually tested this model uh, here in the notebook to check that it's working. Uh, we can also, if, you, if we want to um, have, send some data on the command line, get back a, a set of predictions and we can see that this inference service is running in, in KF serving. So that is all, that uh, information is all in the GitHub repo and you can go and have a look at um, at running the Alira pipeline with model deployment. There's a set of instructions here. Uh, that'll tell you uh, it's, a, it's a little bit more involved to get KF serving up and running but this uh, set of instructions uh, here for how to do that. Okay, so I hope that uh, that has given a, an overview of um, of the power of the Lyra um, and the way that that uh, we can re really uh, bridge both the your, your iteration and experimentation um, and the flexibility that comes with notebooks, as well as the scalability uh, and uh, and then compute power um, and parallelization that comes from a, a orchestration uh, a workflow engine like Kubeflow. Okay, so go back to uh, slides. So it's really easy to get started with Alira. Uh, you can try Alira from Binder, um, you know, from the browser without doing any installation. You can run it from a pre-built Docker container on your laptop, and you can obviously do a you know, full install on your local machine. So you can check out that, that uh, ibm.biz forward slash Elira demo. Uh, check out GitHub, uh, Elira on GitHub. The GitHub repo for the demo that I've shown today is at uh, github.com forward slash code forward slash flight dash delay dash notebooks. There's also another really interesting project that um, my colleagues in the team have created. Uh, which is very, you know, very similar using uh, Elira for a an analytics pipeline focused on COVID nineteen analysis. So that's at GitHub.com forward slash code forward slash COVID dash notebooks. I encourage you to get active in the you know, involved in the community. Find us on GitHub. Find us on on Gitter. Um, there's many many different ways you can you know, uh, be involved in the project from uh, su suggesting improvements, trying it out, submitting bug reports, helping with reviews, and, and joining the community. So thanks very much for joining me today. It's been uh, it's been a real honor to uh, to be part of big things. Uh, you can find out more about what we do as, as Code at Code.org. Um, you can follow us on Twitter, GitHub, developer.ibm.com. I've mentioned the Data Asset Exchange where we, we use uh, a couple of the data sets in the demo today. So I encourage you to check out uh, the Data Asset Exchange on IBM Developer, um, as well as uh, IBM Cloud, where you can actually um, you can run Kubeflow pipelines um, and connect your Lyra to that. Uh, also, don't forget that uh, IBM has a virtual booth uh, at the conference. So I encourage you to go and check that out. Uh, we can find um, a lot of folks to talk to around about, about data and AI uh, and ask questions uh, of the various uh, teams uh, that are on that booth. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Nick, for that in-depth uh, explanation. Uh, they were actually asking you if you could share your presentation, but I believe you've already given the, uh, the, uh, the link, right? I don't know if we could go back a couple of slides to show it again. Sure. Uh, yeah, so people can have uh, enough so time to take a picture. There's the or... link, and um, I'm, not sure if the, I'm not sure if the chat actually works here, but I can certainly dump it in the chat. Uh, yeah, that, excellent. We can see it now, so we're going to give some time for people to take a, a picture or write it down. Uh, I, don't, I don't think it's necessary to drop it in the chat, but if, you, if you're willing to do so, fantastic. Also, Nick, they're asking about the sneak preview that you uh, mentioned. When is uh, going to be available? 
Yeah, I don't think you said the day, um, mentioned dates. I didn't mention the dates. Uh, as far as I recall, it is it's, it's not in the the, the the sort of next release that's it's coming up, but it should be should definitely be in the two dot. I think we're on one dot four dot one on the Lyra now. Uh, so it, it's not, it won't be long, uh, okay. I think a few weeks, uh, but in 2020 then still but I can't give an exact date. 2020? I hope so. Yes. I hope so. <laughs> Excellent. I, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Nick, uh, Nick Pentred, it's been uh, fantastic having you principal engineer at IBM. Thank you so much for your time, for this in-depth explanation. I think you've given us all your secrets almost. So uh, nevertheless, we'll be, uh, <laughs> we'll stay tuned and thank you for all those links. Uh, we'll follow, we'll follow suit and we hope to see you here on the next edition of Big Things uh, Conference. Until then, all our best regards to you and to IBM and see you very soon. Thank you, Nick. <laughs>